Monsieur Ulbeck, Madame Ulbeck, Monsieur et Madame. That is about the extent of my spoken French, so I <laughs> must really, really apologize. I can read a little, but I made a second culture, another culture, my second one, which is the Anglo-Saxon one. I spent uh, 10 years in the United States um, acquiring a PhD and a uh, US citizenship on the way, and that didn't leave much enough time for other ventures. So my apologies for having this address in English <coughs> and um, I called it a personal introduction Michel Ulbeck and Oswald Spengler. I first came across Michel Ulbeck in the mid 2000s. I had just returned from the United States and started my first company and a family. But I still found time to read here and there. I think my first Wolbeck was Extension du Domaine de la Lutte. He was a writer to take note of. Fresh, different, yet despite his modern and blatant style, deeply grounded in European culture. Or at least what was left of it. Or at least this is how it seemed to me. So I immediately bought La Possibilité de Nil and La Carte et le Territoire when they came out. And of course, Soumission. On the way, I picked up some of the smaller works on Lovecraft, Public Enemies, and so forth. Mm, I still have to read Le Particule Elementaire, um, but one should have something to, in store to cheer you up on a rainy day. Because actually, reading Wolbeck cheers me up, at least most of the time. If there is a European literature, Michel Wolbeck sets the standard of how it should look today. His work is deeply European, reflecting an age of atomization and decadence, but still giving us glimpses of the rich tradition that has brought us to where we are today. This shattered and confused tradition is leaving us full of doubt, and yet is full of great memories that still have the potential to carry and sustain us to a certain extent. By the way, I define European as almost any Englishman would do continental Europe without Great Britain. What is different in continental Europe, European world is a certain self-doubt, a certain decadence, a certain complexity. To the Englishman and to his natural heir, the American, the world is clear and straightforward. Yes, there may be complications, but they are to be overcome. History is linear and so are aspirations. Not so on the continent with all its heavy baggage. History does have its pitfalls and maelstroms, plenty of them. Of course, Michel Houellebecq is not only continental European, but French to the bone, the epitome of the French intellectual. This, I pose, demands no further explanation. If one wants to picture a French intellectual, we picture Michel Houellebecq, or Frédéric Baik Beder, as different as their phenotypes might be. And yet, there was something about Michel Wilbeck that touched my German DNA. There was mystery, wonder, even in this atomized, rationalized, cynical, modern world in which Wilbeck's actors plot their cause. There's depth in Wilbeck, potentially to be missed by readers who do not have it themselves, and a certain German-style melancholy. The author himself <coughs> acknowledges Schopenhauer's and Nietzsche's influence. Now is the time to introduce Oswald Spengler, the namesake of our society, and to briefly sketch why we offered Michel Welbeck the, the very first Oswald Spengler Prize, and why we were so thrilled and honored, deeply honored, when he immediately accepted. There was no discussion, very little discussion. Uh, our laureate accepted quickly. After all, we are sm a small society of private citizens, uh, mostly professors, we represent no lobby, no government, no financial interests. We are intellectuals interested in world and universal history, the development of civilizations, and we are inspired by Oswald Spengler. We do honor Michel Ulbeck, but Ulbeck honors our society and Oswald Spengler through his presence and the acceptance of the first Oswald Spengler Prize even more. So what is the connection? At first sight, it is simple. Since the publication of Soumission, our laureate has been routinely named in one breath with Oswald Spengler by the Feuilleton pages. Soumission, the story goes, is a work about the decline of the West. Our laureate has been labeled a cultural pessimist, as has been Oswald Spengler. 
The timing, of course, was eerie, the timing of the book, but so was the foresight of the patron of our society. Um, perhaps someday in Russia, the Holy Revolution will break, break out as bloody as once the Red One did, said Spengler. Is it different in the face of the deep excitement of Islam? Does the appearance of a true caliph, who does not have to fight for recognition because suddenly no one doubts it, is that not outside all possibility, he wrote in 1924. This is the obvious connection. This is the one made in the feuilleton pages, but it's not the ultimate reason why we asked Michel Ulbeck if he would accept the prize. There's a deeper connection. There's a deeper connection. Oswald Spengler is a thinker, but he is also a poet, writer. Michel Ulbeck is a writer, poet, but he is also a thinker. Both share the rich Western intellectual and scientific tradition. Both know that they stand on the shoulders of that tradition. Both know that the time of the West might be ending. And both boldly go forward in that tradition to keep it alive when and where still possible. Both have spirituality and deepness. Spengler was an autodidact, a great synthetic mind, with a grounding both in the humanities and sciences, who wrote in a deeply poetical and even mystical language. Both Oswald Spengler and our laureate also draw upon an extensive reading in biology and evolutionary theory. Both are keenly aware of the biological programs that run inside us and often us. When a culture has run its course, it lapses into its second religiousness. That is a prediction of Oswald Spengler, as many other of his predictions are turning uh, to be very far-sighted and turning into reality. Uh, the uh, mythologist uh, John Campbell, advisor to George Lucas on Star Wars, said, well, it's been something of a life history journey to see every bit, little, little bit of what Spengler promised turn into reality. So Spengler also said, when a culture has run its course, it's lapsed into its second religiousness. The big fights of the culture have been fought, the questions debated ad infinitum. This, according to Spengler, was true in Buddhism, the Roman Empire, and also in Islam which to Spengler is a late phenomenon in what he calls late Majin culture. Indeed, according to Spengler, Islam is 1,000 years ahead of us, of us in cultural development, according to Spengler. Spengler vehemently denied that he was a pessimist, instead arguing that we can only do what is appropriate for our times. We can strive to be good in the crafts demanded of the time, but it would be silly to attempt tasks out of sync with the times. According to Spengler, we live our lives in the winter of our culture. This does not mean that there are no tasks, that there is no culture, but they are specific. Ours is a thoroughly practical age and art, literature, music, are seen to be as business ventures first or also. Spengler, the West European, however historically he may think and feel, is at a certain stage of life invariably uncertain of his own direction. He gropes and feels his way, and if unlucky in environment, he loses it. Very Holbeckian. Holbeck's characters have lost it, mostly. But they still have a core of direction, or at least standing. Spengler continues. But now at least the work of centuries enables him to view the disposition of his own life in relation to the general culture scheme and to test his own powers and purposes. And I can only hope that men of the new generation may be moved by this book to devote themselves to techniques instead of lyrics, the sea instead of the paintbrush, and politics instead of epistemology. Better they could do not. Imagine the impressions these words made on a 15-year-old back in 1979. And I know from many in the society that they had a similar experience. In 1949, shortly after the catastrophe of World War II, Theodor Wiesengrund Adorno wrote that Spengler, who was one of the most widely read thinkers between the wars, had been largely forgotten. But the course of world history itself would confirm Spengler's predictions to a de degree that would be amazing if one still remembered those predictions. The forgotten Spengler has his revenge by threatening to be right in the end. In recent, I'm coming to the end, in recent years Norwegian writer Karl Ove Knausgaard gained publicity and recognition for a six volume autobiographical novel Mein Kampf, Mein Struggle, Mein Kampf. In Germany, obviously, it was not published with its original title. In his review of Soumission in the New York Times, Knausgaard confesses that he never read Ulbeck, 
it is worth to quote the passage. I do not read Wolbeck's books or watch Lars von Trier's films because they're simply too good. What prevents me from reading Wolbeck and watching von Trier is a kind of envy. Not that I begrudge them success, but by reading the books and watching the films, I would be reminded of how excellent a work of art, work of art can be, and of how far beneath that level my own work is. That may sound strange, and yet it can be hardly unusual. If you're a carpenter, for instance, and you keep hearing about the amazing work of another carpenter, you're not necessarily going to seek it out, because what would be the good of having it confirmed that there is a level of excellence to which you may never aspire? Better to close your eyes and carry on with your work, pretending the master carpenter doesn't exist. Michel Welbeck, in his writings, makes no direct reference to Oswald Spengler, at least not one that I know of. Knausgaard does, if only fleetingly, in one of his books. Both Welbeck and Knausgaard to me seem to know that they are writing at the late stage of our culture, where life has lost its naturalness, where even simple things become a struggle. Michel Ulbeck reminds ambiguous and ambivalent about politics. As a writer and an artist, that is both his privilege and his duty, otherwise our laureate would be an activist. This he is not. He is a writer indeed, a true intellectual and an artist. But a message, a message still shines through Michel Ulbeck's works. The respect for the great traditions of the West, intellectual and otherwise. The respect for all that is great, for all that this great culture has achieved in the past thousand years, even if it may be crumbling now. The yearning for salvation, the necess necessity of spirituality, even if our intellectuality has cut, of, cut us off of our roots, the need to reconnect, we have to try, even if our status as enlightened individuals might ultimately prevent us from doing so. The master carpenter does exist, and he's right amongst us this evening. We do acknowledge you, Michel Olbeck, we do read you, and we do thank you for what you have given us.